Thanks. All right, here we go. President Biden delivering his third State of the Union address last night. Could perhaps could be his last. Yeah, he spent a lot of time attacking his, quote, predecessor without saying former President Donald Trump's name. And Biden finally mentioned murdered Georgia nursing student Lakin Riley's name. Yeah, he called her Lincoln. We have team coverage. Griff, Griff Jenkins is live in Eagle Pass, Texas, as migrants pour into Eagle Pass. But we begin with Lucas Thomason at the White House. Uh, is the president getting some applause uh, inside of the White House, Lucas? He sure is, Lawrence. The speech started late, though. It lasted 67 minutes long. And as you mentioned, Ainsley, uh, Georgia Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene demanding the president say the name of that young woman, Lakin Riley, who was brutally murdered by an illegal immigrant in her home state. It's not about him. It's not about me. I'd be a winner, not really. I. Lincoln, Lincoln Riley, an innocent young woman who was killed by an illegal. Now, Biden might have been looking ahead to the NFL draft. USC football coach Lincoln Riley's prized quarterback, Caleb Williams, who's from D.C. and played at Gonzaga High School down the street from our D.C. Bureau, but I digress, is expected to go in the first round, number one, actually, overall. There were other interruptions as well. The father of a U.S. Marine killed at the Abbey Gate during the hasty withdrawal from Afghanistan yelled out the following during Biden's speech. Murder rates went up 30 percent. The biggest increase in history. Biden also called out the Supreme Court. Look, it's a decision to overturn Roe v. Wade. The Supreme Court majority wrote the following. And with all due respect, justices, women are not without electoral, electoral power. Uh, excuse me, electoral or political power. President Biden referred to Donald Trump 13 times without actually saying his name, guys. Yeah, it, feel, it felt very political, Lucas. Uh, thanks so much. I mean, the, for the most part, I actually thought, if I close my eyes and say, where's his speech? I thought it was in the floor of the DNC, <laughs> uh, the Democratic National Convention. And it would have been fine. Uh, you know, he had to come out and he had to show he had energy. He had to not have any major gaffes. And that is true. He delivered the speech. He had confidence. He was late because of protesters, evidently. Yeah. Let me ask something. Why are protesters allowed to block the path of the president of the arrested. United States en route to the Capitol? Why is there is there should be zero tolerance on that? You know, you can block my path to Fox, okay? But not the president to the Capitol. That is unbelievable. But what we saw last night, I think, was a guy that says, Don't try to replace me. I could do the job. Now they have no thing to go on. This is gonna be the matchup. Number two, Donald Trump is in his head. He knew Donald oh. Trump would be li live uh, uh, truth socialing, whatever it's called, truthing. And he also knew that that's who he's going to be going against. So he linked January 6th at home, and he linked Russia mm -hmm. as the enemy, like FDR had. Now, enemy at home and an enemy abroad. That's kind of a scary analogy to give to your teleprompter operator. So a couple of things. Um, love or hate Marjorie Taylor Greene, uh, he was not going to mention Lincoln's name without... Uh, her giving him the pin as he walked the line and interrupting in the middle of the speech. Uh, for once, I actually agree with her on that. I think the president should have mentioned the name that and actually got it right. The second thing is this. How do you see say he's going to unify the country now? I mean, this, as you said, Brian, was a campaign speech. Uh, he didn't reach across the aisle. You even had Henry Cuellar, who's been on this program, saying Joe Biden was fired up. Excuse me, did you talk to him about the border and, and the sanctuary cities that's going on that you said that you oppose? Yeah, yeah this, the unity point is really uh, interesting to me. He, he went in, and a couple of things I saw that were really important, I think, is he, he really he pivoted towards the two-state solution, which is appeasing his, his left, the left for, as far as Israel and Gaza. Um, and really, what is he doing there? He's, he's looking at it, and you talk about why aren't those protesters arrested? Because this entire speech was a pivot to the left. He attacked the Supreme Court to their face mm -hmm. last night. When you talk about breaking from decorum wow, he and decency, mm -hmm. yes, yeah, exactly right. He looked at them and said, women will have their vote. In other words, saying you're, you're voting against women. It was an attack is what it was. And so he did these things that are, that are just red meat to what is the far left. And all we can surmise from that is he believes for this election, his base is the far left. But if we go back 
in, in light years to 2020, 2021, this is what he used to say about trying to unify the country. I pledge to be a president who seeks not to divide, but unify. Who, who doesn't see red states and blue states, only sees the United States. It's time to put away the harsh rhetoric, lower the temperature, see each other again, listen to each other again. And to make progress, we have to stop treating our opponents as our enemies. My whole soul is in this, bringing America together, uniting our people, uniting our nation. My predecessor, a former Republican president, tells Putin, quote, do whatever the hell you want. Many of you in this chamber and my predecessor are promising to pass a national ban on reproductive freedom. A president, my predecessor, failed the most basic presidential duty. My Republican friends owe it to the American people. Get this bill done. My predecessor, my predecessor, my predecessor, but unlike my predecessor, I know who we are as Americans. Times he said president. Yeah, there were several takeaways when I was watching that. First of all, we were all watching to see if he could get mm -hmm. through, you know, an hour or two hours of, of a of a speech. Yeah. Um, he seemed really jacked up. He seemed um, fired up. He was yelling and seemed a little angry. But that's not unity. He's not unifying our country when he talks about what his predecessor did 13 times that he disagrees with. We do need unity in this country, and many people voted for him because they thought that's what they were going to get. The second thing is how out of touch he was. Mm -hmm. We are hurting. People are, can't afford groceries. They can't afford to take their family to Chick-fil-A or take their family to, to mm -hmm. uh, Five Guys because it's 100 bucks for the, for the family of four to have fast food these days. And he starts talking about how much potato chips, how many potato chips are in each bag. Mm -hmm. maybe, they, maybe they are in the same um, realm, but they're two totally different things as well. I mean, I don't really care. I'm not worried about how many potato chips I'm getting in the big Lay's bag when I buy it. I'm worried about how I'm going to afford the chips. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what yeah. people are worried about. And he's talking about Snickers bars. He talked about all of that before he even mentioned the border. It took him mm. 40 minutes into the 67-minute speech to talk about the border. And that's what I mean out of touch. Mm. When you have a gold star dad who's yelling, remember my son who died in Afghanistan at the Abbey Gates because of your decision. And they arrest that dad. Yeah. They take him out and they arrest him. His son served our country and died for our country. And then when he's not even planning on mentioning Lakin's name, and it takes someone, it takes the, the congresswoman that represents her district mm -hmm. and her parents to stand up and say or to yell out, remember her name, say her name, and he holds up the pen right. that she gave him on the way in. He wasn't ever going to mention her name, I don't no, think, because he, he never did in the speech. That was off the right. cuff because what, she forced him to do it. One thing he did, he said he cut the deficit by a trillion dollars. He, everyone keeps telling him, you didn't cut the deficit by a a trillion dollars. Moody says you've added to the deficit. The money that came off the books was the expiring money from COVID yeah. as COVID faded out. Stop mm -hmm. saying it. You're a spendaholic. You spend more than anybody else. The rescue plan that we didn't need, the Inflation Reduction Act, which you say was not uh, we're going to reduce inflation, the infrastructure deal, that's a ton. I mean, he talked about uh, paying your taxes. He talked about guns. And he talked about divesting from China. Has he talked to his son? No. Because his son's got a gun problem. <laughs> doesn't pay his son's tax, got a China problem. problem. Five million dollars. We don't know where that is in a diamond ring. He he said he got rid of, and he's got a little bit of a a, a, a little bit of an interest. Uh, he's got a, a few issues coming our way. Katie Britt was gave the retort. Here's a little bit of what she said about unifying the country. He didn't talk about things that real Americans wanted to hear, that hardworking people wanted answers to, things that we talk about around this kitchen table every single day uh, he failed to mention or failed to give the time they deserved. I thought the anger and bitterness, what seemed to be some type of rage, was unbecoming of the President of the United States. And unfortunately, he used none of his time to bring America together and tell us how we could move forward. Instead, he used divisive long language and, um, and tried to put every party um, firmly in their corner. Last thing I'll say about this is it's clear that Biden did what he needed to do last night to unify his party.
They were all singing his praises last night. You got the pundits on television uh, that are now rallying behind Biden. The Republicans better get it together. Better, better figure out what they believe. They got a nominee now. They need to be in lockstep because the Democrats are going to be in lockstep. I saw James Lankford, who is still pushing this bill ahead. Your party is rejected. A lot of the American people have, re have rejected. Marco Rubio tried to do this years ago with amnesty and bring people together, but he realized that that the people within his party, his base, did not like it. So you got to let it go and figure out what you're going to do to move the country and your party forward. It can't be siding with Democrats and nodding as the president is giving this speech bashing Republicans. Yeah, the GOP divide between the House and Senate, just in style in general, is, is really a detriment for them right now. They've got to get that together and be unified. I think they are. I think that speech unified Republicans. Yeah. I mean, I, I hope so. How many more are going to endorse Trump by the end of the day? Whoever thought they'd be so in line and lockstep? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger just to the outlet. <laughs> well, and Nikki Haley, what are you going to do now? Because Joe Biden put a red line. What yeah. is your red line? I think that the party is is connected, though, when it comes to the big issues: the economy, shutting down the border. I mean, his approval rating is, what, 38 percent, according to Gallup? Is that what it was? I have it written down. 38 uh, percent. 86 percent of Americans say he's too old. Most of Americans want to do something about the border, and that includes Democrats. So I think Republicans are united on the economy, inflation, and the border. But like you said, the Democrats are always unified. Yep. They always stick together. Republicans have always had this divide, and they do have to come together. How do they, how do, they do that? Jim.